Welcome to Redacted. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And on this show, we try to question everything. Good to see all of you on this Tuesday. So glad to have you back with us uh, after a little day off. We got a lot of news to get to on this big Tuesday. We're going to look at this terror alert threat coming from the FBI and United States being warned that, yes, in large gatherings right now, we are going to face a terrorist attack. We knew this was coming. This was predictable. This is obvious when you have a wide open U.S. border. Of course, all of this happening at the same time that the Russians and the Chinese are coming together at a table signing an agreement on security basically against NATO against the United States and of course we're agitating for a war in the Middle East all of this is like coming together in a one big like hodgepodge of a mess for the United States we'll talk about all of that tonight plus Donald Trump makes clear his stance on abortion the mainstream media says see he flip-flops He's all over the place, but has he? We're going to rewind the tape and talk about exactly what his stance on abortion is, uh, even though it seems to be a, it's slid down the ladder of importance of people, what people will vote on this election. So we're going to talk about what that is, how important that is to you, all of that. Of course, Sen Senator Lindsey Graham just came out a few minutes ago and slammed Trump. He's like, well, I didn't slam. He's like, I respectfully disagree with uh, President Trump on this issue. And Trump has gone back and forth this afternoon on Lindsey Graham. It's it's actually pretty enter entertaining to watch the back and forth fight with him and Lindsey Graham. Um, we'll get to that. Uh, we're also going to talk up tonight about uh, you, censorship and where YouTube is basically admitting that they are planning for the 2024 election to basically downrank content and provide more authoritative content so you are not fooled by all of the misinformation out there. Like they will make sure that you get to watch your CNN clips on the election, your Fox News clips on the election. No alt media for you. All of that and more as Redacted kicks off tonight on this Tuesday. So glad to be back with all of you guys. So we thank you for allowing us a little time off with the family uh, while the kids were off for a little spring break. So we were doing a little bit of uh, a little bit of traveling and it's good to be back in the swing of things. Uh, since we don't have a Redacted show open anymore with all the music in the flash, I need to tell you this in front of everybody. This is way too loud. Can you please turn this okay. down? <laughs> I can hear you. I'm right here. Okay. okay I'm sorry you had to see that, folks, b behind the scenes a little okay. bit. So is that better for you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Felt like, oh, my God. So, okay. You, no, you need I'm to hear right. me. You need to hear me I loudly. I hear you, darling. You I, to, I do you need hear, hear me loudly. you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> are you and, even listening? Yeah. Philip and David, how are you guys doing? Doing, doing great. Just Doing uh, great. Yeah. Yep. T had a really nice weekend. Quiet. Did some hell diving. <laughs> did you? It's always a good time. I did. Always a good time. Oh, yeah. I spent yeah. I spent about twenty some hours over two days in Faerun, uh on some Baldur's Gate three. Um, so <laughs> good. To, well, yeah, time well spent. Time well spent, especially time when it's well like co when it's freezing and and or like rainy and cold outside. Good to see all of you guys uh, back here. Let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, someone says chilling in Jersey. Jerry Woodard says chilling in Jersey. Um, someone says, is this for real? Yes, this is for real. Well, um, I don't know what that even means. I mean, life is a simulation, friend. But no, I gotta we be, are uh, as real as it can be. Can I just admit something to you? Let me just be a little transparent here. Over the past few days, like I've just, I, I've been having some like crazy dreams and I've just been really worried. I've just been thinking a lot about like the state of the world right now and thinking a lot about the United States and what's happening. And I'm, I'm, I've been very, very troubled by it. Like I know, like I've wanted to be a midlife crisis or more than no, that. No, it's not. It's a, it's a Biden crisis. Like I feel like it's, um, it's an existential Biden crisis. What's happening in the United States right now. And really worry about this. We're getting warnings of terror attacks in the United States and literally our border is wide open. You have this vote today or you have this discussion today in Congress over the FISA warrants, like wireless wiretapping Americans, like the you you can do this and just yeah you can search Americans without a warrant, like and we're even having to debate this right now. We're having to debate press freedom in the United States. Why is this even a debate? Right. Why are we having these? So I don't know. I've just been having it's just well, been vividly. It's just really been bothering me. Sharing with our audience that where we went on our trip is we took a trip to Normandy to visit the beaches that were stormed during D-Day because it was a lifelong dream of Clayton and the kids had some time off. So we made it happen. And as I was 
just sort of being moved and inspired by this. And I shared some of it on my Instagram, which I welcome you to go and look at our pictures. It was one of the more moving experiences of my life. And I thought, OK, the military has this power. They have a might, right? And at one time, we believed in their ability to protect us, but we don't anymore because our country has been left wide open. It almost seems as though Biden could win re-election in a heartbeat by taking that strong military and putting it along the borders. Why he won't do that, I don't know. It's inexplicable. And even if he did it now, no one would trust that he would leave it there past re-election if that were in fact to happen. But I felt almost hungry for something to believe in like that. Again, no matter what you think of D-Day, no matter what you think of who caused what or who won what, I understand I saw lots of comments about who actually won that war. I get it, right? But this was a show of collaboration and something that people sacrificed for a, for something they believed in. Something greater, right? Liberty and freedom and... These people died I, I just so they thought so that other people yeah. wouldn't have to. Okay. Yeah, and I just feel like, you know, you asked me that question. You said, what would you do right now? Like, if you were president of the United States, what would you do about the southern border situation? And we were just driving, talking. We were literally going around the different beaches in Normandy, and I said... You know, if I were president of the United States right now, and I never would be, but if I were, I would immediately remove our military from these bases around the world where they are going to be sitting ducks right now, which we'll get to in a second. And I would immediately deploy them to our U.S. southern border and frankly, our northern border at this point. I would reinvest that money back home in the United States, into our schools, into our infrastructure. I would put our military back where it was for almost 100 years at our southern border, protecting our southern border. And there's just like, oh, we've never had military at our southern border. Yes, we have for most of our history. And imagine what, imagine if Biden just had some sort of like demented moment where he's like, you know what, I actually, I guess I am an American and I'm going to stand up for America now and I'm going to actually redeploy these people in the United States and I'm going to protect our liberty and our sovereignty. And I'm going to also, while I'm securing the border, I'm going to, I'm going to double or triple the power of ICE. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have them literally go door to door and round up these terrorists who we've opened our doors and let into the United States. Imagine that. And it's just amazing to me that we're even having to have this discussion. But instead, Congress is A-OK -okay with sort of them sitting, like sitting ducks, in places that we cannot secure them, yeah. our military, uh, and threats to them in Syria, in Iraq, in Iran now, or threats by Iran. And that's unacceptable. And yeah, so those are... Uh, my traveling thoughts. Uh, Someone said, you sound like RFK Jr., but you won't mention him. I just mentioned him. Who, me or you? Me. I mean, absolutely. Like, there's there's quite a lot I agree with on uh, with with RFK Jr., and uh, we've talked about that openly here And on we've show. invited him on our show, so yeah. don't say that. We have no bias. Yeah. So, no, but I'm just talking about how I feel personally. Like, I'm not picking a candidate or anything. I'm just telling you how I feel personally about the situation. And, like, it's just bothering me at my core and seeing these men who gave the ultimate sacrifice on that day for our liberty. And this is what's happening. And it's really sad because it's almost approaching the 80th anniversary of of that day, you know, just in on June on June 6th. Um, and uh, just in a few months, just in, you know, two months here. And to think about there's only a handful, there's maybe on, you know, like, I don't know how many Like left a dozen. I uh, Googled it. Of D-Day survivors who are going to go and show up there on the 80th anniversary. And to think like, I just, I just, I don't know. I, I can't get inside their head, but to think what they must be feeling about their own United States right now and what, what sacrifices they made. And watching what's happening to their country, it's got to be, it's got to be demoralizing on a whole lot of levels. And I just, I, my heart goes out to those individuals and for the, those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. But we've got a lot to get to tonight, so um, we're going to get there in a second. But first, I want to tell you right now, before we do this, I want to tell you about our friends over at Lear Capital. Before we get into tonight's top story here about this war and these terror alerts, because right now our friends at Lear can help you get gold. Right now, in all of this craziness that we've seen over the past few weeks. We've seen gold surging. Why? Because it is a it is a rock 
during crazy times. And by the way, while we were gone, I looked at our national debt clock. Hundreds of billions of dollars have now been added to the national debt clock. Look at that. That's unbelievable up there on the screen. Hundreds of billions of dollars already added to the national debt clock while we were gone. That's unbelievable. And that's the U.S. dollar going down the tubes as world hegemony, well, the Western hegemony now is collapsing. So anyway, that is to say our friends at Lear Capital can help you actually get gold and silver and buy it and have it shipped right to your house. You can store it in your gun safe. Uh, you can store it off-site in an off-site facility, wherever you prefer, that's under guard 24 hours. By the way, they can help you do that. Just give them a call. They're fantastic patriots. 1-800-613-3557 for your free gold guide as well. Just call them and talk to them. They'll give you a free gold guide so you can talk about it with your spouse, your loved ones, and your family. Or go to learredacted.com. That's the place to go is learredacted.com. Well, the United States is about to suffer a massive terrorist attack on the United States soil because, of course, we are. And those aren't my words. Those are the words of the FBI, which is warning that an attack on America is about to happen. And who could have seen this coming, by the way? Well, how about anyone with at least a Forrest Gump IQ could have seen this company coming? Could it have anything at all to do with our wide open borders and funneling billions of dollars in weapons to Israel to destabilize the Middle East? Congresswoman, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, has an idea about this. She tweeted this uh, today. She said, um, the FBI is saying a terrorist attack is imminent. Of course a terrorist attack is imminent because they keep the border wide open and millions have invaded. Do you want to know why this is a messaging, why, the, why, why this is the messaging right now? She says, because the FISA is up for reauthorization and they need maximum pressure on Congress to vote to reauthorize FISA, which the FBI unconstitutionally used to spy on hundreds of millions of Americans. If they really cared about terrorism in America, they would shut the border and mass deport, but they don't. They care about controlling you. My eyes are wide open. None of the stupid tricks fool me anymore. So I gotta say, she's making some sense, you guys. I, I gotta say, she's you can just sense, and I, I, you know, watching her interview with Tucker the other day and just hearing her passion right now, I mean, regardless of what, what you feel about her, she is, I guess some of that sentiment that I was talking at the top of the show tonight is that feeling that I have, this sort of anger about what are you doing to my country? Like, I am fed up. She's fed up. We should all be fed up at this point. And I feel like she's tapping into that right now. I'm not trying to, I mean, maybe she's trying to score political points. I doubt it. I think she's absolutely angry and we all should be angry. So where is this terror attack going to happen? We don't know. Of course, large gatherings, they say, so we can't live our lives like we couldn't during COVID because terrorism. Why don't you bring back Tom Ridge's, you know, red, yellow, green alert system so we can all live in fear and terror. Or you could shut the border and protect the United States of America. There's an idea for you, but you won't do that. So they'd rather keep you in fear like this. That's what they do. You turn over your liberty to them. That's how this goes. We're watching the collapse of the West happening in real time unless we slam on the brakes right now and reverse course immediately. Perhaps worse than a terror attack on U.S. soil, though, is the prospect of an all-out war with Iran in order to protect Israel, where that could kill tens of thousands of Americans. So we'll start with this question today. Should Americans die in order to protect Israel? It's a simple question. To me, it's straightforward. Should we allow Americans to die fighting in the Middle East? Because that's what the Biden administration is about well, to let happen. That's a good question. That's a good question. Should any Americans die fighting in the Middle East? Has that ever gone well for us? Never. It's never has, going well for us. Has it ever secured freedom for anybody? There is no data at all, and there is no argument to be made that our involvement in the Middle East has made America stronger. Well, quite the opposite. Please, I beg you to watch my segment on the Orlando nightclub shooting. That is a direct result of the terror that we wage in the Middle East because that shooter was not homophobic, had nothing to do with rainbow flags, nothing at all. He wanted his region to stop being terrorized by ours. The media lied to you about that and put rainbow flags all, the, all over the place and told you that this was about gay hate. Wasn't. So those kind of things are inspired by our democracy voyages. Yeah, and so many people in the chat room right now just reading all of your chats here with my spectacles. 
Should Americans die in the Middle East? No, um, overwhelmingly no. No, Lucky Don, Donnie says no, Queen Bee. No, no, Queen Bee. That's right. I get it. The bee uh, shirt's no, back to me. No, no, no. Uh, Leo says terror is spelled C-I-A. Um, Debbie Klein in our chat says, yes, Americans should die for Israel. Okay, there's one vote for killing Americans for Israel. Hmm. All right. Uh, so no, overwhelmingly no, except for Debbie, who says yes, we should die for Israel. I think Debbie is being facetious, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Debbie. Uh, well, how about if you vote for that, then you go or your family? Yeah, or just yeah, it's totally up to you. Oh, so overnight, the Biden administration attacked multiple targets in Yemen, striking air defense systems and drone operations centers. The Yemeni Houthis have told Iran that they are prepared to go to war against the U.S. and Israel. And they told Iran that they have now more than 400,000 fighters ready to completely blockade the Red Sea. By the way, this is not Hezbollah we're talking about. This is the Houthis. This is Yemeni soldiers right now who have told Iran they have 400,000 ready to go to completely blockade the Red Sea and target U.S. bases in Africa and the Middle East killing American soldiers if we continue down this path. We know this, and the Biden administration has publicly talked about this. They said it's only a matter of time until Americans die. They've already admitted to this. Corinne Jean-Pierre standing up at the podium has said that this is the case. They know this is going to happen to Americans. Get them out of there right now. They're doing nothing to stop it. Bring them home, get them out of there. This is all, of course, in response to the United States and Israel bombing an Iranian embassy in Syria last week. Iran says very clearly this morning that we know the United States was behind the attack. Here's that press conference, and I will, I will add my own voice over the transcription here. Listen. I would like to state with a loud voice that the U.S. is responsible for this incident and must be responsible for it. Uh, أريد من هنا من دمشق أن أقول بصوت عال بأن أمريكا لها مسؤولية في هذا الحادث الإرهابي ويجب أن تتحمل هذه المسؤولية. The Israel regime will be warned, they say, and the UN Security Council will be punished. The failure of the U.S. and two European countries to issue a statement. On the violation of the Vienna Conventions and the attack on the Islamic Republic of Iran in Damascus, in Damascus is a sign of the green light of the United States to Israel for committing this crime. I emphasize again that the United States must be accountable for its behavior and support for the terrorist actions of the Israeli regime. Okay, I would just like to say that's not us, sir. We don't want that. That's our leaders. Yeah. I, I do not want to be attacked for that. I hate those assholes. Exactly. That's your CIA, and that's the Biden administration, which has fomented this, this, this decision. And they're going to let Americans sit at these bases and be used as target practice. That's treasonous. They know it's coming, and they've said it's coming, and it's going to happen. The Yemenis, meanwhile, have recruited another 200,000 new fighters since the start of the conflict. The U.S. is having a hard time recruiting anything right now except illegal immigrants and transgender soldiers who want free penis removal surgeries, which you can get, by the way, just join the army. That's what they'll do to recruit you, give you free gender transition care and surgeries. That's what the U.S. will do right now. America's recruitment numbers, of course, as we've shown you on this show, are totally in the toilet. So they managed in six months to raise an army of an additional 200,000? So we'll come back to the war in the Middle East in just a second. But first, the U.S. just went to China to lecture the Chinese and the Russians went to China at the same time, mind you, to sign an agreement to protect themselves against the United States and Europe. You can't make this up. In fact, Russia's Sergei Lavrov went to a meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping, along with other members of the upper echelon of the government, while Janet Yellen, our Treasury Secretary, was in town. And Xi Jinping is hanging out with the Russians and basically ditching Janet Yellen. 
Hey, well, you can. Sh- he's you, kind of a snooze. You, you can. Know? You can just meet with some of my underlings. Basically, <laughs> we can. You can. I, I don't. I don't want to meet you. She's with you. boring. Well, this, is it amazing? This is yes. what I was talking about. You know, we know that the BRICS nations is economic, but I said like if we kept messing with them, they were going to join up then, and it would be more militarily, right? Like yes, nations. yes. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like that's what's happening. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that, right? It was. It's. It's now moved beyond just like the BRICS nations getting together economically. It is all about security. It's an answer to NATO, and that's exactly why they were there with this meeting. Among the things they agreed to, military support in case of a war with the West and financial support away from the U.S. dollar. They formed a new security alliance over the past few days against NATO and new alliances against U.S. sanctions and Western sanctions, with a particular attention paid to, quote, hegemony and power politics, end quote. In other words, we're done being bullied by you militarily and financially. So we're coming together, China and Russia, going to protect ourselves against this. So Biden did this. This well, has been like this has been US put dollar, forced in this way. The U.S. dollar is basically one of our biggest weapons. I mean, it's a it's a weapon we yeah. use willy nilly on little countries and stuff to intimidate them and and force them to do things we want them to do. It's 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 our most silent but deadly weapon. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. And it smells like that too. It's our cudgel that we use. So they've also, in this agreement that they, that Sergei Lavrov and Xi Jinping, um, have jointly agreed that Ukraine's demands for peace are ridiculous. So among, like their meeting notes, they're talking about Zelensky and his peace plan that he's put forward, which of course includes give back the land that you've been terrorizing since 2014, killing ethnic Russians, right? We, Ukraine, want that land back, so give it back to us, even though we've been bombing civilians in that area, and those people don't want to have anything to do with Ukraine. They want to be part of the Russian Federation, but give it back to us. That's just one of the pieces of Zelensky's peace plan. And Sergei Lavrov says that, yeah, we just had this meeting, and uh, no, China is totally in agreement with us that this is a laughable situation. This is laughable. Watch. My Chinese colleagues and I confirmed the conclusion about the futility of any international events that not only do not take into account Russia's position, but completely ignore it, that promote the, promote the completely empty ultimatum, so-called Zelensky peace formula, and are thus completely detached from any realities. So no. So sorry to Ukraine, sorry to NATO, but China and Russia are aligned on this issue. If it threatens Moscow's security, then China will have their back. At the same time, they were shaking hands across town in Beijing. Janet Yellen was there lecturing the Chinese. She was there literally lecturing the Chinese. Uh, Four four things that she said. Uh, Number one, you guys manufacture too much stuff and you send it to us and we buy it. That's basically what she said. I love that. Dastardly. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) You guys make too much stuff and we buy it. Okay. Well, if they put those limits on us like they want to, then we wouldn't, you know. Yeah. We'd have nothing. Like who wants to? Oh, we'd meet our social credit score because we bought too much on Amazon from China. Right. And then we wouldn't have that problem anymore. Have our carbon footprint monitored by you guys. Number two, she said to, to them, to the Chinese... She said, don't support Russia. If you continue to support Russia, that could be very bad. Russia relies on you, so you should stop helping them. Listen. President Biden and I are determined to do all that we can to stem the flow of material that's supporting Russia's defense industrial base and helping it to wage war against Ukraine. That's embarrassing. (laughs) Yeah, so... Anyway, so number three on her list, she said, we should also, we should keep talking. Yes, I agree with that. Talking is good, especially talking with your enemies, your adversaries, to have a conversation with them. Talking is good. And number four on her list, uh, she showed off her chopstick skills uh, while, e- while eating Chinese food. And she told everyone um, she, loves, she loves Chinese food. So that's great. So it's a tale of two visits. Do you Back- think she makes them cross like Is like that a bad baby? to cross them? I think that. 
you know, more experts, they don't cross. They just kind of touch like that. Mine cross because I'm bad they, at they it. Should not cross. Yeah, they, they should not cross. They should not cross. I think she had, yeah, I think she had good chopstick skills. So she, she likes Chinese food. Yeah. Clayton's actually much better at it than I am. His don't cross. Uh, I well, because I was young, more. Mr. Miyagi taught me when I would catch flies. <laughs> so that's how I... <laughs> So it's a tale of two visits. Back home in the United States, neocons and Democrats are begging to send more money to Ukraine, arguing that Russia is about to launch a massive offensive to wipe out what's left of Ukraine. And we need to send more weapons and money to Zelensky right now. Republican neocon Senator Mike McCall says that if Republicans don't want to send money to Israel and Ukraine, they're clearly under Putin's control. He literally said this. They're clearly ingesting Russian propaganda, the senator says. Here's another member of Congress, Mike Rogers, who is a neocon from Ohio, who makes a lot of money from the military industrial complex. He's as corrupt as they come. He here he is agreeing with Mike McCall after Jake Tapper asked him that question. Uh, Congressman McCall made a comment this week about um, what he says sounds like Russian propaganda from, from some conservative media uh, and why it's so difficult to explain to Republican voters why supporting Ukraine is important. He told Julia Yaffe, quote, I think Russian propaganda has made its way into the United States, unfortunately, and it's infected a good chunk of my party's base. He singled out primetime shows on conservative channels. Do you agree with him? And, and how big is this problem? No, oh, it, it is absolutely true. We see directly coming from Russia uh, attempts to mask communications that are anti-Ukraine and pro-Russia messages, some of which we even hear being uttered on the House floor. I mean, there are members of Congress today who still incorrectly say that this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is over NATO, which, of course, it is not. Uh, Vladimir Putin having made it very clear, both publicly and to his own population, that his, his uh, view is that this is a conflict of, of a much broader claim of Russia uh, to Ukraine. Eastern Europe, and including claiming all of Ukraine territory as, as Russia's. Now, to the extent that this propaganda takes hold, it makes it more difficult for us to really see this as an authoritarian versus democracy battle, which is what it is. President Xi of China, uh, Vladimir Putin himself have identified it as such. We need to stand up for democracy. We need to make certain that, that we know uh, that authoritarian regimes never stop when they, when they start an aggression. Um, Ukraine needs our help and assistance now, and this is a very critical time for the U.S. Congress to step up and provide that aid. So critical time, you say. So yeah. For who? So Putin, Putin is literally now controlling members of Congress. So when 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 anti-Ukraine members of Congress are on the floor, it's Putin's. He, they're just doing Putin's bidding, apparently. Oh, when did that happen? Yeah, apparently there's so much of this anti-Ukraine rhetoric happening on the floor of Congress right now that. <laughs> We're, we've continued. We're literally about to send them sixty billion dollars. Um, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has a different view. She can't believe that neocons and Democrats are trying to send another sixty billion dollars to Ukraine while our southern border is being invaded. Watch. When you saw Zelensky right there on that interview talking about, oh, we're going to lose territory. Oh, we really need this money. This $60 billion should have been approved yesterday. Let me tell you, we are losing our country to the illegal invasion that's happening every single day at our southern border. And I am so pissed off about it because the American people are pissed off about it. And while our so-called Republican Speaker of the House is only working with Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries and Ukraine first, Mitch McConnell and the White House and Jake Sullivan, who he talks to on the phone all the time. We are angry and people have had it. We don't want $60 billion to go to Ukraine because as we slept last night, Tucker, we just went $40 billion more into debt. And that's because the interest in our debt is so huge and our debt is so massive. This is happening while we sleep every single night. So no, we don't want to send $60 billion to Ukraine. We want to put our country first. It's time to care about America. Yeah, imagine that. So time to care about America. Now's a good time. But if you don't stand with Ukraine, then apparently you're not pro-America. That's the distinction, right? That's, I guess, what Chuck Schumer is trying to say. Well, Go ahead. You're, you're more not pro-democracy because it's more we're, we're fighting for democracy over there. You oh, know right. What I mean? Yeah, you so cancel like elections, you cancel elections, you put uh, soldiers with Down syndrome out there in the field to fight, um, you, yeah, you drag people out of their college classes, basically, to go fight in this mess right now, and you also um, uh, lock up and arrest priests. That's that's democracy in in action in Ukraine. So here's Chuck Schumer. 
He says, though, it's Republicans who are to blame or to blame for Ukraine losing this war right now. Republicans. The Congress gavels back into session. I also urge Speaker Johnson and House Republicans to snap out of their paralysis and pass the Senate's national security supplemental. The situation in Ukraine is desperate. Speaker Johnson has now sat on his hands for 55 days as the national security supplemental has collected dust in the House. That's 55 days of America standing on the sidelines while our friends in Ukraine fight and die on the battlefield with no support. 55 days of our European allies wondering when the U.S. will step up. And with each passing day, Ukraine continues to run out of more ammo, continues to run out of soldiers, and continues to run out of hope that can successfully expel the Russians from their borders. And let's be blunt, the biggest reason Ukraine is losing the war is because the hard right in the Congress has paralyzed the United States from acting. That's it. That's the reason. Good. Speaker Johnson has to decide for himself whether or not he will do the right thing for Ukraine, for America, and for democracy, or if he'll allow MAGA Republicans to hand Vladimir Putin a large victory. I'm confident that if the Speaker puts the Senate's national security supplemental on the floor, it will pass. It remains the best, quickest, and most realistic way to get Ukraine the help it needs. So it's if you're a hard right, if you're a hard right MAGA Republican, you're a Trump MAGA hard right person, then you are the ones that are keeping Ukraine from victory. And you, I just cannot follow. It's extremist. I just, yeah, it's really extremist. You're like, he's, I just wanted to say, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I guess if you want to call these people hard right, it's so it's hard right to like want to put America first and not want to send $60 billion more to go be flushed down the toilet when American tent cities, I mean, you just saw the report on Oakland, California. I mean, these disgusting tent cities are popping up all over the place. I mean, no wonder the Oakland A's don't want to remain there in that city anymore. Who wants to be in that city? That hurts, Clayton. That was rude. Well, I know. She's from Oakland. So uh, sorry to say that, but that's absolutely true. Just drive down Philadelphia. Drive down any major American city right now, and you're going to see this mess. But we want to send $60 billion to to Ukraine. Makes a lot of sense. So just so we stand, just so we're clear on where we stand on this April 9th, 2024, the U.S. Congress is actively trying to send $60 billion to Ukraine. We just approved a massive new weapons package package to Israel to carry out genocide. We told Netanyahu that we want to cease fire and they should pull out of Gaza so trucks could deliver aid to starving individuals, which are, you know, famine widespread and, and getting worse. Zelensky said, send us this money now. And Netanyahu just told Biden to go F himself, basically. So we're going to attack Rafa very soon. Being... And the U.S. is in bit being invaded at the very same time. Yeah, all of that at the same time. And we don't give a crap yeah. about anything here in the United States. But we do care about what Netanyahu wants and what Zelensky wants. Those are our priorities. Um, on top of all of this, we learned today that Iran is about to launch a massive attack against Israel in response to the U.S.-backed embassy bombing last week. So what are we going to do? We're going to sit back and watch the Biden administration right now drive us all into a massively bloody conflict. On top of all of this, we just got some breaking news. Russia now says that the Bidens, yes, Hunter Biden and Joe Biden, are directly connected to the terror attacks in Russia that happened the other uh, two weeks ago in Moscow through Hunter's Burisma company. That is claimed by the Russian Investigation Committee. This is unbelievable. Watch this. По итогам проверки, организованной в связи с обращением группы депутатов Госдумы и иных лиц, Следственным комитетом России возбуждено уголовное дело о финансировании терроризма. Установлено, что денежные средства, поступавшие через коммерческие организации, в частности нефтегазовую компанию «Бурисма Холдингс», действующую на территории Украины, на протяжении последних лет использовались для осуществления террористических актов в Российской Федерации, а также за ее пределами в целях устранения видных политических и общественных деятелей и нанесения экономического ущерба. Следствием во взаимодействии с иными спецслужбами и финансовой разведкой проверяются источники поступления и дальнейшее движение денежных средств в размере нескольких миллионов долларов США, причастность конкретных лиц из числа сотрудников органов власти общественных коммерческих организаций стран Запада. 
Кроме того, следственным и оперативным путем отрабатываются связи непосредственных исполнителей террористических актов с иностранными кураторами, организаторами и спонсорами. Okay. So there you have it. Well, shit. As people in our chat right now are saying, I knew it. So there you go. You can follow the money. Follow the money right into terrorist attacks inside of Moscow. Okay, so remember when Donald Trump said that he could kill somebody and not lose voters? Apparently, Joe Biden's family can too. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to see, right? Right. He could walk on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody in peace. Yeah. Right. Okay, so can you organize a whole terrorist attack and kill 140 people can and you, still get reelected? Can you blow up a Nord Stream pipeline? Yes, and uh, tank a whole economy. Can you still get elected on that? I don't know. How that depends how stupid Let's your electorate our... is. So you guys, that's guess, what you're voting for. But you reelect Joe Biden. Or you're just being handed a cell phone when you cross the border and a couple thousand dollars in cash and you're being told who to vote for. So uh, that yeah. could that could help things out a little bit. Could do, anyway, I suppose. So, yes, we're watching and waiting. The FBI says a terrorist attack is imminent. And uh, so it's going to happen in large groups in the United States. They can't tell you where, though. So please renew that FISA warrant to warrantless wire, wiretap and search Americans um, unconstitutionally. And this is where we're at right now in the United States. Let us know your thoughts on that. We've got more news to get to here on your Tuesday. We're going to talk about Trump and his uh, what the mainstream media calls flip flop on abortion. But did he really? No, maybe not. Uh, we'll talk about that. And Lindsey Graham's response to that he's pissed about it. Um, we're also going to talk about YouTube. And this new censorship industrial complex, which continues to roll along, Edward Snowden weighing in on why the president of the United States won't support the Press Act, which is guarantees freedom for journalists, free from oppression and fear to be able to do their jobs. But YouTube is actively planning to make moves in the 2024 election so that you only get served up proper content. So you don't have to be worried about all of that election content out there. Right, exactly that. Um, before we move on and tell you about our show sponsor, though, I want to say um, we got called out in the chat for giggling at some of the comments. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I laughed a little loud during one of the thoughts, one of the sound bites we were playing you, because one of the comments did actually make me laugh about Janet Yellen. Should I repeat it or is it racist? You could, well, I don't Should know why I? it would be racist, but you could say. Maybe it's a little racist about Janet Yellen eating in China and someone said to Maybe it is racist. Why is I, it I think racist? it's racist. You're not supposed to say racist against dogs. Yeah, like whether they served her dog meat. It just made me. Laugh. I'm sorry if that's a, if that's a bad joke or an inappropriate joke, but I was laughing and I got called out for it. So, I, <laughs> but you guys, don't fool around. Yeah. We're doing seriously. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it'll be okay. Okay. It'll be okay. Raven says it'll be okay, Natalie. It will be, be sure. okay. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about Donald Trump and his stance on abortion, as well as the Catholic Church, in just a second. But first, we want to tell you about our friends over at Fast Growing Trees, because did you know that Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S. with more than ten thousand different kinds of plants and over two million happy customers in the U.S. Now, maybe you think, oh, well. I don't need that. I can just go to the Home Depot. But a lot of times those trees that you find there, they are so hopped up on drugs. They're basically drug addict trees, the ones you get at your local, you know what, box warehouse store, because uh, they've been pumped full of hormones and then watered like crazy. They don't do so well when they get to your house because they're super shocked. So you want a nursery that knows what they're doing. Fast Growing Trees has everything you could possibly want, like fruit trees, palm trees, evergreens, houseplants, or more, whatever you're interested in, they have it. And they also will find the perfect fit for your climate and space. So if you don't live in a place that can grow avocados, they're not going to sell you an avocado tree, no matter how much you might want one. Avocados and lemons, that's what everybody wants, right? Uh, and also they have a their 30 day alive and thrive guarantee. They offer free plant consultation to make sure you keep that tree alive. So you don't need a lot of yard space. You can grow whatever you want. So it's springtime planting season. If you are ready, check out fast growing trees. They have the best deals online, up to half off on select plants and other deals. 
And listeners to our show get an additional 15% off their first purchase when you use the code REDACTED at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com using the code REDACTED at checkout. Offer is valid for a limited time. Terms and conditions apply. Once again, that's fastgrowingtrees.com slash redacted. All right. Well, for the voters who still hold abortion as their single issue for casting votes, we now have clarity on where candidate Donald Trump stands on the matter. And we have news from the Vatican about their stance on abortion because they issued a clarification document that's been hotly anticipated. Now, let's talk about this. But first, let's talk about how much it will even matter in 2024 in the elections in the United States. Now, Rasmussen recently reported that abortion is actually a less important issue to voters than the economy. That should probably surprise nobody. Duh. Right? It always is. Yes, but election does, uh, abortion does win elections from time to time, just not when we're quite so screwed up. Right, exactly. When we're like sort of in better times. Yes. And Karl Rove can like roll into Ohio and use it as like a cultural wedge issue in certain counties like Hamilton County for Bush against Kerry. Yes. Then it can sway counties. and certain, But no, overall, people care about putting food on their table as the main issue right now and protecting their families is the main issue. But issues. Democrats, as we saw in some of the ads that were baiting people of color, specifically black and Latino voters, Democrats are putting this at the top. Like we are going to protect abortion issue abortion access because as we talked about before they think all of us hispanics are sluts and need to continue to get abortions all the time so they are putting it at the top uh whether or not it is or not now i want to say as someone who formerly sort of supported the democratic party on abortion i feel very lied to about it i feel like the democratic party lies to you about abortions they present it as a woman's empowerment issue that should just be as easy as going through a drive-thru uh but did you know that having an abortion increases a woman's risk of breast cancer by quite a lot you would think if democrats really cared about women's health they would tell you this like abortion is hard and it may in fact increase your risk of breast cancer by many orders of magnitude but they present it as health care as getting an abortion is health care um i feel like that's a lie this news shocked me i wonder if it has shocked you and in fact scientists have known about this risk since at least the early 90s it stands to reason it's because pregnancy surges estrogen in the body and stimulates breast growth. And then when that process is disrupted, those cells are at risk. Did you know that every full term pregnancy that a woman does have reduces her risk of breast cancer? Why don't they tell us this? I feel like that's a lie. Now, again, I feel betrayed by how this research is hidden from women who are told that they should just have full access to abortion whenever the heck they feel like it. Um, and I wonder if women who are watching this feel the same way, because I don't want my daughters to view abortion as a bellwether of female empowerment when, in fact, it can hurt you. Right? OK, so we can have a little powwow about that later, ladies. The men in this chat are not globbing on to that the way I, f I find that very shocking. Okay. No, they're going to hide that data. They're going to hide that scientific research. And they're going to also tell you to like continue on hormonal birth control pills. They, they just did a heat, you know, a bit massive hit piece in the Wall Street, uh, in, in the Washington Post this week about hormonal birth control. And they want to push this as a bellwether of female empowerment. And they will not tell you that it increases breast cancer. They won't tell you any of that. Right. And if you do report on it, you'll be suppressed, blocked, banned from even talking about it. Okay, so, well, anyway. let's see how this how this goes. If you want more research on that, I can present it to you. Uh, but let's get to what President Trump now says about abortion. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones on this position because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is, 
the baby is born, the baby is executed after birth is unacceptable, and almost everyone agrees with that. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. The right. will of the people. Yes. Imagine that. The will. Wouldn't that be a novel concept in the United States? Right. So what he's doing is not lashing out at Democratic states that have chosen to protect abortion rights or promoting Republican states that have chosen to restrict abortion rights. He's saying this is a regional issue. Uh, and he's talking here about Roe v. Wade, which the Biden administration is fighting to bring back as a federal law. Roe enacts a federal law that bans states from banning abortion. I know that's a double negative. It just means that abortion was a federal right was overturned. It has become a state issue. He correctly states that even pro-abortion legal scholars knew that Roe v. Wade was a prop problematic law, enforcing a federal law where a state should be. Um, and he further goes on to say that he supports abortion exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. Of the mother. So is this a departure from where Trump was during the 2016 campaign? It's not. It's not really. Uh, he always said that he supported abortion exceptions, and that went against the Republican Party platform. Here was a 2016 headline. Trump says, I would change the GOP platform on abortion. All he said was that he would support abortion, but support these exceptions for these three reasons. Now, you may recall that the media really got riled up when he said something about punishing women for abortions as a hypothetical, they really were like, oh, you're going to get abortion and they're, they're going to arrest you. You're going to get punished. Right. The media loved that. Do you remember this media frenzy? Yeah, of course. And it was super fun. Right. Like, oh, my God, he hates women. He wants to lock you up. He later said he didn't really mean that. And having the abortion in and of itself is punishing enough for a woman, which, which most women who have had them would tell you is true. No one should aspire to this. What he was when he was pushed about this, you can see that he was pretty consistent about how this is the law of the land and he thinks it should. Now, we're going to see a clip of him from two, 2016 when Roe was still the law. And he's saying the law is the law, but I would like to see this become a state issue. The laws are set now on abortion, and that's the way they're going to remain until they're changed. Because you had said you wanted, uh, you told Bloomberg in January that you believed abortion should be banned at some point in pregnancy. Where would you? Well, I, first do of the all, ban? I would have liked to have seen, the, you know, this be a state's rights. I would have, I would have preferred state's rights. I think it would have been better if it were up to the states. Uh, but right now the laws are set, and that's the way the laws are. But do you have a feeling how they should change? There are a lot of laws you want to change. You've talked about them on everything from libel to torture. Anything you'd want to change at on abortion? At this moment, the laws are set, and I think we have to leave it that way. Do you think it's murder, abortion? Um, I have my opinions on it, but I'd rather not comment on it. You said you're very pro-life. Pro-life view pro is that it's abortion. Yeah, I'm, I'm abortion is yeah. murder. But I, I, uh, I mean, I do have my opinions on it. I'd rather. I just don't think it's an appropriate forum. But you don't disagree with that proposition that it's murder? What, what proposition? That abortion is murder. No, I don't disagree with it. Okay. So it seems, I mean, back then, everyone wanted to hate on Trump for his abortion stance. They all said he was misogynist, that he didn't understand women. But when you watch that, now, how many years later, eight years later, it's like, oh, that actually was pretty reasonable. He wanted to respect the law of the land, and he wanted it to become a state issue. Uh, so here we are, right? It doesn't, he doesn't seem so crazy now, although the host was very entrapping. He really wanted to draw out Trump to say abortion is murder for his peace, and he wouldn't. I wonder if he would do the same to Joe Biden, who brags about being a Catholic but breaks with the Catholic Church to promote abortion. Do you think the media would do that? In fact, two years ago, U.S. Catholic bishops overwhelmingly approved the drafting of a teaching document that many of them hoped would rebuke Catholic politicians, including President Joe Biden, uh, for receiving communion despite their support 
for abortion rights. Uh, funny, the media didn't really pick up on this one very much, except this live Fox stream. Joe Biden was getting this rebuke from the Catholic Church for breaking with his faith. They didn't seem to care. Uh, but let's take a look at what that Catholic Church document said. This is a highly anticipated document called the Declaration Dignitas Infinita on Human Dignity. We've sort of been waiting on this for a couple of years for the Catholic Church to lay out all of their sort of human dignity stances. There's a really interesting piece here about transgender surgeries, but we will save that for another topic. But here is the section on abortion and they mince no words, uh, that mince no words. They declare unequivocally that procured abortion is the deliberate and direct killing by whatever means it is carried out of a human being in the initial phase of his or her existence, extending from conception to birth. Now, the media would have you believe that most people disagree with this, but that's not a recent what a recent poll states. Again, another Rasmussen poll found that 52% of people do approve of the overturning of Roe v. Wade and at least some restriction on abortion. So knowing this, I wonder what you think. How much will abortion play into the voting pool this year? How much will it affect voters? Um, how much of this well, will be set off a renewed culture war? Let us know what you think. Go ahead, David. And I want to point out that Obama and Biden both ran on codifying Roe versus Wade, and they had an opportunity several times, and they didn't do it. And the reason they didn't do it is so that they have this talking point to fight Republicans over abortion because they could have they they had the the a majority two times and yeah, they could have yeah. easily done it but they didn't right exactly and they use That's it as this point. cultural wedge they don't want to actually do anything that affects you know what affects you know as most Americans are dealing with the high inflation cost of putting food on the table right now job security um, all of it right they don't want to deal with any of that. What they want to deal with are these cultural issues, and they use these in their campaign ads. And so, of course, they had the opportunity to do it, and they didn't do it. And then they sit here and complain about it, and then they want to blame Trump for it. So we'll see. Yeah. Let us know your thoughts on this in the comments below. We've got more news to get to here on your Tuesday, so we'll keep the train rolling. I want to talk about what Edward Snowden just said about President Biden on press freedom. We'll talk about that and what YouTube is planning to do for the 2024 election. We'll get there in a second. Plus, we're also going to talk about Brazil versus Elon Musk and a bombshell story there. What will happen to X employees right now, uh, Twitter employees, X employees, whatever you want to call them, in Brazil and this fight for free speech in Brazil and the safety of those individuals there. We'll talk about that. But first, we want to tell you about this, which is, look, it blows my mind that more people are not talking about this right now. And it's crazy to me that people aren't really focused on having this in their house because the, on Thursday, March 21st, the court ruled that the FDA must delete every social media post addressing the use of ivermectin for treatment of prevention of COVID-19. It's been determined that the FDA lied in their demonizing of ivermectin and other effective drugs for the last four years, vindicating doctors like we've had on the show, a friend of the show, Dr. Peter McCullough, who pioneered the McCullough Protocol and stood strong despite every cancellation campaign. But the question is, why are still the people, like a lot of people are asking, you know, like, how, okay, how do I get ivermectin? How do I get my hands on it? How can I get it in my house to make sure we have it on hand in case of an emergency? Because most doctors still won't even pre consider prescribing it. Well, keep listening because we got you covered. Our friends are um, over at the Wellness Company. They have their Contagion Emergency Kit. And it comes complete with the McCullough Protocol, and it has you covered. It's the only of its kind. The prescription kit provides you with a carefully selected assortment of effective medications for COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses. Ivermectin, uh, z pack a whole host of other um, medications in there to help you with this, along with a nebulizer and a guidebook for safe use. Um, it's all backed by research and endorsed by the most world-renowned experts. The Wellness Company's Contagion Emergency Kit is a must-have. You should just have it on hand in your house at all times. Go to twc.health, twc.health slash redacted, and grab your Contagion Emergency Kit right now. Just grab one, keep it in your house, um, and if you use the code redacted, that'll save you $30 at checkout. 
Um, so just, you know, $30 a checkout. It'll save you that. Use the code redacted. Kits are only available in the United States. I see a lot of people asking, are they available overseas? No, unfortunately, with the way medicines are and, and laws and all of that, it's uh, just for the United States. So if you're in the U.S., grab one of these, twc.health slash redacted. Get 10% off at checkout. That's 30 bucks. That'll save you some nice cash and have one of those on hand uh, in the house. Very important stuff. All right. Well, we've been warning you that censorship in America is going to get worse leading up to the 2024 election. And they desperately, of course, want Joe Biden to remain in power. Last week, President Biden's press secretary was asked if President Biden would support the Press Act, which is like a home run. It's like an easy one. It's a layup, right, for any president. The Press Act protects all journalists, regardless of political leanings uh, or establishment credentials like Hey, are you a Fox News journalist? Do you have the badge to get into the White House? Or do you work for the Daily Caller? It doesn't matter, right? Regardless of credentials, if you are a member of the press, you are a member of the press and you are protected in the United States of America. That's what the Press Act would do. And it would make you free from government surveillance and overreach. And Corinne Jean-Pierre wouldn't even comment on it when pressed by a reporter, a member of the press. Watch. Does the White House have a stance on the pending federal press shield legislation to pass the House and that Senator Schumer told me he hopes reaches President Biden's desk this year? You're talking about the Press Act more specifically. Yes. Look, and I said this, I've said this many times, I said this last week, where journalism is not a crime. We've been very clear about that. Uh, and uh, as it relates to this particular legislation, uh, I haven't reviewed it. Would have to talk to our, our Office of Ledge Affairs on that particular legislation. But I do want to say, back in October of 2022, the Justice Department codified a policy to ban subpoenas of journalist uh, records. Uh, the president strongly supports the right of free and independent press. That is something that the president <laughs> talked about when he was at the gridiron. Uh, the president talked about this at the last White House uh, Correspondence Dinner. He's been very consistent uh, about this. And I'll just quote him for a second. A free press is a pillar of any free society. And while we may not always agree with certain coverage or admire it, we do admire the courage of the free press. Journalism, again, is not a crime. Before moving on, just to confirm, no stance yet on the Press Act that you're aware of. And the Assange matter is they're concerned about that. Uh, you know, I, I don't have much more to share besides what I just laid out here, um, so I'll just leave it as uh, what I just stated <laughs> to you. Been in prison and five years. I understand. I, I hear. I hear. I heard the question. I'm just not going to go beyond from what I just stated. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, so not, she's like, I just orated my personal philosophy. <laughs> Is right. that not enough? But no, I want to know what the president, his stance on the Press Act. Sorry, he, I'm not going to comment on that. Well, I, I like that. Well, I like that you know, she aside. points out that journalism is not a, uh, sorry, but uh, she points out that journalism is not a crime, but you know what is a crime? The government getting involved in suppressing free speech. That's right. literally like, I th it's kind of high up there in the Constitution. Uh, I think it was what, like the First Amendment? Might be the first one, maybe the second. I maybe think the so, 12th. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, it's, point out, I'm, yeah, they're saying that, but look at what they did to James O'Keefe with the diary that he had, uh, right. look what they did to that reporter that just got arrested for J six. Um, right. you know, I mean, it, it's look at Julian Assange. Yeah. I was going to say the well, most yeah. blaring one. Right. And he well, asked her, that's why I said Assange aside, but yeah, like it's, he's like the, the, the number one, like, well, she says journalism is not a crime and yet apparently it is a crime. And if you're not on Team Biden, or if you're not in the liberal media, uh, then it is a crime, and you will be suppressed, and you will be... We saw the collusion, of course, with the Biden administration, with Twitter and Facebook, suppressing information about the Hunter Biden laptop story. Um, be, the, the, the list right. is endless, right? Well, Julian Assange was not liberal or Republican. He's neither. He only expo exposed American and British war crimes, and <laughs> that's not partisan right no but of course to them it is it's they, he committed the gravest offense right which was actually revealing right the if journalism is not a crime why is there an indictment of julian assange right so, so it's, not a, it's not a crime if you're not very good at it if you're really good at journalism then it's a crime then it's a problem <laughs> and so and why was Assange, <laughs> right. who is the journalist right he's the one that's spent all these years in prison but chelsea manning is 
not. And that's actually the person that got the information that Julian Assange posted. Hmm. So, well, Chelsea Manning did go to prison and his release. Was... Well, yeah, went to prison, but it hasn't been exiled from the United States and, you know, basically dying in a. In a right. In a, in a, in a, Chelsea yeah. Manning had it rough. That's that's there was no picnic for Chelsea yeah. Manning. So no comment on the Press Act at all. As Daniel Schumann writes, the policy director for Demand Progress, he says freedom of the press is built upon the idea that journalists can report the news without fear or favor. Exactly. Without fear or favor. Here's what NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden had to say about it, and he's spot on. You can be sure that if the president of the United States, of all people, won't say if he supports a bill protecting the free press, which is the easiest sort of win you get in politics and right before an election, there is a reason. And it's a reason that you should worry. Yes, that is spot on. Um, I mean, this is an easy layup for a president of the United States. We stand for the freedom of the press, free from uh, free from favor, free from persecution. Uh, and it's not it's really sad that they won't comment on it. And the, the press secretary, you know, is reading right from her binder like the president is going to like sit this one out because they want to, of course, suppress speech. That's exactly what the Biden administration wants to do. As president of the United States can't say that he supports a free and fair press, free from government interference, free from persecution, prosecution. The men who fought and died for this country are giving you the middle finger right now, you piece of garbage. The men who gave their lives for freedom and a free press, you can't support this legislation, you can't speak out for it? You're disgusting, and you're, it's shameful. And if you needed any more confirmation that censorship is the new norm in the United States, look no further than YouTube. We have confirmation right from YouTube's mouth that they have a, quote, responsibility to manipulate and censor content on YouTube ahead of the 2024 election. This isn't hyperbole. They published a blog post admitting this. And Reclaim the Net did a great write-up on this. You can read, I love Reclaim the Net. They do a great job. It's part of my daily reading. YouTube says it has a responsibility to manipulate algorithms leading up to the 2024 election. It says YouTube has a plan to remove and suppress some content and boost what it what decides are are th uh, are are th I can't say that what it decides are are authoritative source. That's hard to say together. Why don't you guys all at home try to say it at the same time? See if you can do it. Decides are are authoritative sources. Can you say that? Mm -mm. You're not even to decides try. Decides are. Arthur, no, it's our, our, you want to go our, our authority. Our, 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 our. <laughs> I can't say it anyway, but, you no, two. but I was just going to say uh, really quick, like we, we talked about this, like how Google, which is YouTube wants to inoculate you with only the information that they feel you need to know, like right. they want to suppress everything else. Yeah, exactly. They want to give you authoritative sources like a CNN or these other, you know, these other garbage sources as your authority or the Associated Press, mouthpieces of the deep state, mouthpieces of the intelligence community. That's what they want to give to you. YouTube is reframing its censorship policies as responsibility. So this blog post, the company says that its censorship policy can be summed up with four R's. Maybe that is R R. Four R's, remove, raise, reward, reduce, or in other words, censor, I guess. So here is their blog post. You can read it for yourself right on their website. The four R's of responsibility, removing harmful content. We've been removing harmful content since YouTube started, but our investment in this work has accelerated in recent years. So our first step is to remove content that violates our policy as quickly as possible. And then we want to raise up authoritative voices when people are looking for breaking news and information. So who's authoritative? Who's authoritative when there's like breaking news about a subject? Same, who is it? You know, I was going to ask that same thing. Like, is Dr. Peter McCullough like a, like a, a, a cardiologist who's been studying for, you know, several decades? Is that authoritative? Well, and used to used to help the White House. He used to help at right. the White House. Or is you know, Dr. Fauci authoritative? Or is CNN authoritative? Well, what they say in this blog post is they're going to use AI to find these authoritative sources. So even better. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to know? Well, I guess what, we're out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like Because remember Google Gemini, right, which is their AI program, right? So it's garbage in, garbage out. It's how they're prompting 
this AI, right? It's how they're training this AI. It's how they're writing this AI. As Elon Musk pointed out, it's what you're putting into it is what you get out of it. Well, you would think. So basically, I was going to say, basically, that only only a black Benjamin Franklin is going to be authoritative on anything in YouTube, according <laughs> right. to... I suppose. Yeah. Well, just remember, we broadcasted during the pandemic. Many people were given strikes or deplatformed on YouTube for suggesting that previous exposure to COVID might offer superior immunity to a COVID vaccine. And the words natural immunity became hot button issues that YouTube was scanning for in order to pub punish. Now, fast forward to the year 2024, we now know that that is true. It's unequivocally true. You would think that those people who at the time were considered guilty of wrong think would be boosted in authoritative credit, but they're not, right? right. And so YouTube doesn't have a lot of credit for authority, given that they don't even allow people to wonder or ask questions, especially during the pandemic. Right. Yeah, they would. Otherwise, they would have fast tracked our million sub button. Yeah, we don't we don't have that. Yeah, but because we got banned four times and they took us off the air and and, and blocked us. So we weren't allowed to do anything for two weeks here on the platform multiple times for violations, whatever, um, of their covid policy of their war policy. Who knows when we were you know, covering the propaganda coming out of Ukraine, we were covering that we got banned. Um, well, and, so, the th and, and I want to point out too the four times that we got banned every single time we ended up being correct and nothing like we still lost the income. Uh, yeah, we right. still have the strike sitting on our channel. Yeah, we can't get the play button like every like there's no apology like, hey, we were we got it wrong. Nothing. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. We should have more authoritative points, but instead we have less. Right, because we got it right. What we were saying was accurate, and they were then they blocked us and banned us, and it didn't matter. And we've gotten no apology subsequently. I mean, and by the way, the then they hold on. I just want to say. Then they also changed yeah. their terms of service. Maybe that's what you were about to say, Philip. Then, that's exactly what I was about to say. Go ahead. Sorry, you, you'll say it better. No, that's fine. I just it's they they so now. As it stands now, if we were to say what YouTube had banned us for not saying, if we were to say what they were recommending, they would ban us again. Yeah. Isn't so that we crazy? Were, we were not only right, we were not only right on the subject, but we were so right that like YouTube had to eventually come around and make that the policy. Right. No apologies. I love someone in the chat said, uh, redacted Raimundo said, I love when we get a, we get a stupid comment like this every once in a while. It says, redacted is controlled opposition. I always laugh at that because it's like some throwaway phrase. Like, what the hell does that even mean? By we, who? By who? I would love to know. We've literally been banned multiple times on this platform. Um, and when we know, like when we look at Google, uh, YouTube's terms of service for a story, um, and like we're going to cover something on COVID or something related, we can't talk about it. We specifically say we can't even do this story on YouTube. We're not even going to try because they will literally block it and ban it. So we're going to just exclusively show it to you on another platform. And we have to do that regularly here, unfortunately. I mean, technically, um, we're all controlled by Philip because he can mute us and change cameras. And, right. you know, yeah, well, so, well I mean, and I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I get some strange looks at the bank when I'm cashing my direct check from Putin, the CIA, <laughs> the WEF every mm -hmm. week. You know, like, right. when, I, when I go in there, they're like, who, who yeah. are you? And I'm like, like I'm controlled opposition. You're controlled opposition, aren't you? But I reported in my FATCA, so don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, we don't work for those other those other news agencies that are our controlled opposition. You know what they are. Um, anyway, jo Johanna Vulich is the head of the new chief product officer at YouTube, says that you, YouTube will use AI to reward creators to empower creativity while also removing content that they claim violates their policy faster. Raise up authoritative voices for news and reward trusted um, eligible creators and then reduce content that brushes up against their policies. So as we pointed out, like brushes up is a vague word. Well, I mean, how do you, I mean, I guess that's what we do all the time on our, on our show here is we brush up against. And I think there's a that, misspelling right? in there. And on number two, I think that actually is supposed to be raise authoritarian voices. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> well, I want to know how they're going to reward trusted eligible creators. Like, and what do you have, what do you have to do to get into like their good graces? Right. Just carry the Biden sort of talking points 
on a whole host of issues. You have to host the Hunger Games like Caesar Flickerman. <laughs> and then you've sold your soul to the yes, capital. That's right. And that's what you become. So Flickerman. we're, yeah. Flickerman, or like do like a Don Lemon style show and you'll be rewarded. You'll be elevated. You have to be, you know, that's what you have to do. Well, but he's not rewarded with views, so. But maybe they'll just, they'll amplify him. Like, they'll put him on the front page. They'll, like, amplify him. He's No one's actually watching his content at all, but then they'll I, reward I don't know you that for that purpose. amplification would help a guy like him. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. It's beyond redemption, that one. So, anyway, um, you know, Janet, uh, Johanna Vulich explained that because so many countries right now are going through elections in 2024, she did this interview for the YouTube blog, and, uh, and she said, you know, look, because they're going through this in 2024, all of these elections worldwide, they want to make sure that viewers can get the most authoritative content around election topics, and it's their duty to protect you from misinformation and they're going to rise up authoritative con content. So don't be surprised like if you're on YouTube, you're just going to see tons of like CNN, MSNBC, BBC news content all That's over like, the place. We're, we're it's going to feel like a joke, the, but they don't mean it that way. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to protect you from a manipulation of an election by manipulating the election. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all anyway, right. this is a good opportunity to remind you all that, yes, we do have another place you can watch us if you'd like. And so it's a it's a free speech platform. And you know what it is. Uh, we're, if you wanted to visit us over there, you can. Uh, it's rumble.com slash redacted. That's where we are over there. You can come over. It's censorship free. They don't do any of that stuff. Um, and we're also on BitChute as well. And we're also on X. So if you want to watch us streaming any of those spots, you can do that as well. But uh, yeah, this is what's happening for the 2024 election. We knew it was going to come. We knew this election censorship was going to be in full force. And YouTube is admitting that they are going to be a part of it. So they're actively well, going to be a participant in it. And I want to point out, too, we probably need to be careful because anybody who's talked about previous elections being stolen or, or whatever, they, they sometimes will retroactively make a rule and say you can't talk about something and it goes back and if you've ever talked about it they can take those videos down so like that's what i that's what i was thinking they were going to do because they they released they relaxed that policy they said okay now you can talk about it so a bunch of people have talked about it and now to protect the elections again they might be like well you know we we said that but now we're going back on that and boom three strikes you get three videos taken down you're out yeah yeah, yeah they're going out after. of the conversation Oh, that's what's coming, guys. Anyway, let us know what you think about this in the comments below. And uh, yeah, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel wherever you want to. I mean, you can follow us, subscribe to us. It's free to be a member. We, uh, you know, again, it's free. And uh, we, we are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time. But we've got another big story we're going to be covering here, which is this Brazil story versus Elon Musk. and Which is the authoritarian template that most governments want to follow right now. Brazil is just going ahead and doing it. Uh, so we're going to talk with Alexandre Guerrero about this in just a second. But first, we want to tell you about our friends over at Genucel because we've been telling you about Gen 90. That's the latest breakthrough in skincare from our friends at Genucel. Well, did you know it also works on those annoying bags and puffiness under your eyes instantly? Yes, those bags under your eyes from the lack of sleep or being overworked and stressed. Even those seasonal allergies that come with spring weather where you feel like your face is in perpetual swollen mode. That's been me. The spring was a doozy. Well, you can instantly reduce the appearance of looking older anywhere you use it around the eyes, the forehead, crow's feet, laugh line, even under the chin, and it starts working in seconds. So you don't have to worry about the confidence of your skin anymore. Gen 90 technology is luxurious, paraben free, silky smooth, and best of all, it starts working in seconds. There's a reason why Genucel has 400% customer loyalty of any other skincare brand. And now Genucel's classic under eye bags and puffiness serum can be taken care of with Gen 90 and order their luxurious Genucel XV collagen builder moisturizer with vitamin C and hydraulic acid and a pure natural base for stuff Stunning results day after day. So go to genucel.com right now for incredible packages, over 50% off during their spring sale. Uh, it's guaranteed or your money back. So go use our link, if you please, to let 
them know that we sent you. It's geniusell.com slash redacted. Order now and get a free limited edition spa box and a bonus gift plus free shipping. Once again, geniusell.com slash redacted. Last time that's geniusell.com slash redacted. Brazil is quickly descending into an authoritarian government by demanding censorship and punishing Elon Musk, both personally and his business, for not complying. You would think that maybe the Biden administration would speak out against this, but this is something they clearly want to do, too. Uh, I feel like all Western governments are salivating that Brazil is doing what they want to do. They are fighting in the Supreme Court, the Biden administration is, for their right to do this very thing. As we speak, Brazil demanded that X shut down accounts that they didn't like, and Elon Musk refused. Here is Elon Musk in an X space just the, over the last 24 hours where he explains why. What about things like the latest developments in, in Brazil and um, so on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the, the, uh, <clears throat> we, were, we kept getting these demands from... Um, uh, this uh, judge uh, Alexander, um, that's his, that's his name on Twitter at, at Alexander, um, and there would be to suspend accounts um, immediately. We were given typically two hours to suspend an account or face massive fines. Um, and the the final straw is we were we were being given demands to suspend sitting sitting members of the parliament and major journalists. And moreover, we could not tell them that it, this was at the behest of uh, Alexander Morales. We had to pretend that it was due to our rules of service. And that was the final straw, and we said no. Now, the government is retaliating, saying that they will consider revoking Starlink contracts. Now, some are also reporting that ex-employees in Brazil have been warned that they, too, could be arrested. So is this really as scary as it seems? Well, joining me to discuss is Alexandre Guerrero. He's a Portuguese legal and political expert with a large following in Brazil. So he joins us to discuss. His YouTube channel is also a great, a great place for all of this context. Uh, now, Alexandre, thank you for joining me. I want to say that as I've been following this, I read Portuguese at about a third grade level. So I'm hoping you can provide us with some extra context. I hope so too. So what's wrong here we, on this case is that Brazil has uh, some laws uh, which basically they punish uh, what's called, used to be called uh, a hate speech. Now you ask, but what does uh, the Brazilian law provides about hate speech and to what extent can we consider a certain speech to be considered to be hateful. Uh, this is the $1 million question because it's absolutely uh, subject to the interpretation of the judge, of any judge, and of those who apply this same law. So that's one of the reasons why basically Elon Musk refuses to comply with such laws because what X or Twitter, depending on of, of the person who now is watching this, uh, prefers but basically uh, they want, they prefer to ban and to block or to censor specific contents that leaves no doubt, regardless if you are a left wing or a right wing supporter, that this was a hate speech, for example, some kind of hate against uh, someone because of their race, uh, some kind of speech that inspires others to, to uh, go to violent behaviors against others. This kind of speech leaves no doubt, but when we enter the field where uh, the, a specific court from a sovereign country demands acts to block specific accounts just because they don't agree with what these accounts say or with what these kind of or, or what the followers of these accounts usually demonstrate in public just because they don't agree or they, they think it's harmful or it's not true then you got into a sensitive aspect of all this problem. And that's where it started, the, the, the war, let me put the label like this, between Elon Musk and Brazil. Uh, but at the same time, we have, of course, some, something that we should think about, which is to what extent can a, a foreign company, regardless if they are a media or an internet company or a social media, whatever you want to, to call it, uh, that can be considered to be more sovereign 
and can comply or not with the law of a specific country. This is the main question that we should do because I understand and I have read Elon Musk's critics towards Alexandre de Moraes. What the decision was from Brazil was that if you don't accept to block these accounts, then you are disobeying court orders, which means that we need to block the access to X on Brazilian territory. So this is quite a strong statement by the Brazilian judiciary. But at the same time, we see that Elon Musk's statements in the social media uh, and every kind of social media, or also in X, what he usually does, and in the recent, most recent hours, has been against Alexandre de Moraes, trying almost to inspire to a rebellion in the country. This kind of speech from Elon Musk is seen in Brazil by many people as uh, in being able to inspire Brazilians to riot against their own government because they will have to choose if we want to have access to X and our freedom of speech is being by this time targeted by uh, this kind of law supported by Lula da Silva's uh, main friends, because Alexandre de Moraes was one of the closest friends of Lula da Silva, then we want to kick this government out of the power. So it's a very sensitive issue, but first we should, we should think to what extent can these kind of companies have more power and become more sovereign in sovereign countries? Okay, that's a tough one then, because he's saying your elected officials are doing this, and they will, to Brazilian people, revoke your freedom of speech and your access to the rest of the world. And so, yes, I can see, but do they have, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm stumped by this, right? Because they have a right to access the global platform that is X, uh, but you're right, then he has more power than their elected officials. So what are the nuances then with the Brazilian people? Can they see how they too are in a, backed into a corner? Well, yes. Uh, basically, the choice between and of these two options is quite tricky. And that's one of the reasons why, and I'm remembering the first uh, things that you mentioned uh, minutes ago, which was uh, in Brazil, they did what here in the West most of the, the countries don't have enough courage to do, which is to block a, a, a network like or a company like X, like Meta, so on and so forth. They don't. They are not brave enough to take these kind of bold decisions, which means that they are afraid of the reaction of the public if they just dare to block the, the, the activity of such companies. And in the end, the Brazilian people are between in a crossroads. Either we support our sovereignty, regardless if we are left or right wing supporters, because Alexandre Moraes, all the arguments that Elon Musk used, yes, he can be a, a totally uh, right about Alexandre Moraes. Still, in the end, he is a judge of a sovereign body of Brazil. So, which means that in the end, like we say in law, dura lex sed lex, this is a Latin. Uh, uh, saying that we have, which means in the end, the law is the law. Regardless if it is unfair or not, we have to obey it. And when you have a person like Elon Musk making these kind of bold statements against Brazilian authorities, then at the same time, we should all ask, when did, did, did Elon Musk ever make some, so, such kind of comments? For example, against the Chinese authorities. Mm -hmm. So he's choosing now Brazilian authorities first because he doesn't intend that he's not, it's not expectable that he wants to go to Brazil. Otherwise, if it was the case, I can sure tell you that if he puts a step in Brazilian territory, it is highly likely that he gets arrested for inspiring the Brazilian people to riot and to protest, to create and to promote a civil and social unrest from, the, from the, the Brazilians towards their own government. And if we remember how the last presidential elections took place um, some months ago, then maybe we think that this is quite of a sensitive uh, season in Brazil because there, there's a country of around 200 billion people that's divided in two, right-wing supporters and left-wing supporters. And now comes Elon Musk. Yes, their, uh, their freedom of expression 
is at stake to a certain extent. But in the end, it, they, it has to be the Brazilian people to confront their own politicians, not inspired by Elon Musk or by any other foreign uh, personality. Was there an option for him to go through an official channel and say, well, then I will appeal this to a higher court because you are censoring the speech of your people? Could he have not done it this way? No, there was no alternative because it was already a decision taken. This last decision from the Judicial Court of Brazil comes after X rejected to comply with previous decisions to, to block some specific accounts and to delete specific uh, what's, what was considered to be hate speech messages on Twitter. So uh, because he rejected to comply with that decision, in the end, what they say is, if you don't want to obey to our decision, then there's no other alternative. You can't appeal any other uh, future decision concerning this problem. You will just be blocked from being in, uh, active in Brazil. So that's basically it. Although he can go to the Constitutional Court, to the Supreme Court of Brazil, because it's not considered an appeal, it's more like a complaint in order to demonstrate that his, his own freedom of speech and his own access and activity of X in Brazil is in jeopardy with no explanation whatsoever. But you could make the case that the Brazilian government now is retaliating by going after Starlink and saying, well, then everyone will be punished and won't be able to access Starlink. We saw this play out in Florida with the punishment of Disney. And so are there laws in Brazil that pre prevent this type of retaliation? Yes, yes, there are this kind of laws in Brazil too. And basically the story that's being told of those who support the, the, the government in Brazil is that Elon Musk is pursuing this kind of mission against Brazilian sovereign authorities because of the recent deal that was made between President Lula da Silva and the Chinese President Xi Jinping concerning the exploration of lithium in the country. So what's being spread in Brazil presently, and to a certain extent it makes sense, is that Elon Musk is not happy whatsoever with the opportunity to be put away and being separated from the opportunity to explore himself these kind of natural resources that Brazil has. So in the end, whatever happens to the X, there's only one solution to this, which is for X to comply with the decision of the judicial body. Well, you and I like to use X a lot, and we know that X is still a conservative place for what you can and cannot say. And so if X had already allowed those accounts to go forward and had not censored them, it, what do you think, what, what was the content? Can you give me a summary of what it was that the Brazilian government really doesn't want people to talk about? For the time being, I haven't, uh, I wasn't able to find uh, what, what kind of messages were here, but what has been being debated in Brazil over the last months is that some kind of any kind of messages, for example, of supporters of President Bolsonaro uh, or any other right wing movement that the left wing extremists see as being hate speech or something that denies the, the ideology of gender equality, so on and so forth. This is considered to be hate speech in Brazil okay. by left wing authorities. So here we have a huge problem, which is all these messages that actually represent the freedom of speech, uh, freedom of opinion, whatever you want to call it, they can be punished by Brazilian authorities uh, because they accuse X to spread this kind of ideas that they consider to be false ideas, not according to what the ideology of the government says, and to inspire people to spread more hateful speech. So, Basically, according to what I found out so far, was these kind of messages were suggesting that there was fake news behind it and at the same time hateful speech. Uh, but the notion of hateful, hateful speech in Brazil is kind of uh, inspired by the woke wave too, because in Brazil, if you try to say anything against, for example, gender equality, any, anything concerning race, 
whatsoever, all this will be considered to be hate speech. So right. it's a very tricky the situation in Brazil present. Trans ideology is really strong in Brazil. A lot of it, uh, the, the more extreme cases, in fact, is born there. We've seen and You see the violence. You look at the violence in the country and it's kind of worrying because you see uh, the only the only aspect that people usually have in common is if they are supporters of President Bolsonaro or pre supporters of President Lula da Silva. This is a major concern because basically we have a country divided in two trenches, the left wing against the right wing, and all the judicial stuff is inspired by politics, just like that. That was how we have Lava Jato in Brazil. That's why we have now this judicial investigation against former President Bolsonaro. So all, everything uh, of, because, uh, that takes us to the, to the judicial sector, all this is, is inspired only by political factors, yes. not by criminal factors. But we see here it's the Brazilian people who would lose. They would lose access to free speech, access to a platform, a global platform to connect them to the world. Um, and we see this. I don't see any way that the Brazilian people come out on top of this. Do you? No, no, no. What I've been witnessing now is that uh, Brazilians, uh, especially those that support the continuation of the activities of X in the country, they really see this as a threat to the freedom of speech. And I totally agree with them because it's a bold decision that even if we can discuss the, the, how legitimate it was the decision against specific accounts, in the end you're blocking everything of X either if they are legitimate or not. So, of course, this is an attack against uh, free speech. Of course, this is an attack against a person and a company which has been related with conservative movements. But even if they are conservative, that's the right Elon Musk has to be. The same goes for the X network. You can't just block everyone, even those left-wing supporters that want to have something to say on X, just because few accounts uh, were not blocked and X did not comply with the decision. Do you know what this reminds to me? I, 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 to me, this is the continuation of what Kim.com actually represented uh, with Napster. Because back then, he was not also responsible for the contents that people used to share on, the, on Napster. But in the end, he was the one who was punished. Napster was punished even if it was sharing legitimate files, so on and so forth. And probably Kim.com was the first to open this kind of discussion and these kind of problems between uh, sovereign authorities and uh, specific companies that are yet so popular that the, the, the politicians are afraid to lose their power and their powers to the, these companies. Yeah. Well, this is a really tricky one. Thank you so much for your context on this. You can follow Alexander Guerrero. He's got a YouTube channel that is definitely worth following. Uh, it is in Portuguese, so you have to do subtitles, or you can follow him on X with his full name as well, right? Or, or what is your X handle again? Well, we've yes, got it. A.T. Guerrero. Okay. Thank you again for coming on Redacted. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure to take good care. That's going to do it for us today on Redacted. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be back here tomorrow, we promise. Same time, same place. It's 4 p.m. Eastern. Hey, don't forget, we have a Redacted store. Over the weekend, we got some awesome photos of Redacted viewers in their hoodies. Uh, so you can find out all of our merchandise at redactedstore.com and see if you can show the world that you support independent media. It's more important now than ever, given the story we just discussed. So again, redactedstore.com if you'd like to check it out, and please do. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody.